Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's a little wet outside. Good thing the roof doesn't leak, right? Yeah. I was kind of curious if I was going to make it up here in time. I was snacking on those blueberry donut holes and cinnamon rolls from yesterday's men's breakfast. All right, good morning. For those of you that are watching online, please give us a shout out in the comments. Let us know you're here. Uh, we'd love to have you join us sometime here in the future in person. This Wednesday, we have uh, Bible study and prayer at 7 o'clock, so we invite you to join us for that. Um, it's just been a whirlwind the last several weeks as we have gone through, finished up the Lenten season at Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and then last Sunday we had Easter. Uh, we are just thrilled. It, it can be kind of coming like coming down off of a mountaintop high, like going to a conference or something, but we have to remember that we need to move forward and uh, looking forward to this morning's message about what we are to do with the cross. What, what does that look like for us today? So uh, shortly we'll get into that. So buck up and prepare for that. Prepare your hearts and your minds for that. But that's coming. Uh, then next Saturday we have our next installment of the Orange Track Racing Season 19. Uh, for more about that, go out to orangetrackracing.org. Registration is at 9.30 with racing at, uh, we say 10, but that's an approximate because, you know, sometimes it takes a while to get all those cars lined up as people are still coming in. So uh, we won't hold hard and fast on that if you're just a little bit late coming in. And we had men's breakfast yesterday, so that means the next one is May 4th. So we invite you to join us for that. We had uh, toads in the hole yesterday. I understand I wasn't able to be here. It was at a, a granddaughter's birthday, uh, but I understand it was very good and uh, that I missed out. So uh, thank you for bringing back the donut holes and the cinnamon rolls so I could at least have a portion of that. My blood sugar doesn't thank you. Um, with that, uh, that's it for the announcements. We're kind of at a point where we can focus on God now. We've got a whole lot of event going on, but we can get back to focusing on God the way that we need to be. Um, for those of you watching online, Mark is posting up the link to this week's worship music, so we invite you to join us uh, after this service by listening to that music and uh, just worshiping, again, from the words that you'll hear from the message that God has given to Mark this morning. And then this music will just take that and bring it to a different level for you. That all said, uh, let's go to our call to worship this morning as we prepare our hearts for this very important message this morning. This morning's call to worship comes from John chapter 3, verses 11 through 17. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know, and we testify what we have seen. And you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent of the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world, through him, might be saved. Now as I think about these verses, and then I'm looking at this, and we, we get to that point where it says, and Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. That's from Numbers. And it's in that reference that if you haven't read it, the people who had been bitten by the snake, God had Moses create a bronze snake and lift it up, and anyone who looked at it would be healed. We've given their life back. Jesus, in this passage we're reading, is lifted up onto the cross, as we saw, as we read about last week and we talked about last week. And anyone who looks up to Jesus and puts their hope and their faith and their trust into Him is not just given 
their life here, but they're given an eternal heavenly life. God loves us all, and his love is not just sentimental. I mean, we can have sentimental. I love looking at old pictures from my childhood. That's sentimental. I love reading the scriptures over and over again because it lifts me up and it brings me closer to God. That's relation. We are prompted, therefore, into action. Sentiment doesn't bring action. It sometimes might bring tears and it sometimes may make your heart feel good, but it doesn't do anything for your heavenly and your eternal life. God gave us his son as a substitute for our sin. He died in our place, bearing our sins. But it requires us to do something. It requires us not just to have faith, but we have to put faith into action. Trust Jesus as your personal sin bearer. And as you do that this morning, listen to the words that God has given to Mark this morning. Father, as we prepare to hear these words, as we prepare to hear about what the cross means for us today, not just in yesterday or the day before, but from today moving forward, it has a whole lot of different meaning for everyone because we're all in such different places, Lord. But Lord, let us hear the exact words that you have meant for each one of us today. Let us truly understand what it meant by you having Jesus go to the cross 2,000 years ago, taking on our sins and making us righteous in your eyes. In Jesus' name. Good morning, church. Good morning. Yeah, it's kind of dreary outside. But you know what? It's always a good day to bring Christ into our lives, to be able to worship Christ from our heart on out, regardless of what the weather looks like outside. It's always a good day in God. And we got to keep that in mind, especially when we're walking out there and it's raining. And if you're like me, I've got this really cool haircut. Yeah, kind of like yours. And uh, my cool haircut up here, you know, there's no buffer. And so these nice cold raindrops come falling down on your head or snow or ice pellets like the other day. Really get you going. For that. I'll tell you that much real quick. But anyway, today is the day that the Lord has made. And let us rejoice and be glad in it. Because, see, we got a fresh start. When, when we were woke up today, we got a fresh start. We need to rejoice that we have another day in God's presence, another day of life. And if we realize that and we start our day off in that kind of mindset, then the things of the day don't seem to kind of take it over. And so every day is a good day, and we need to rejoice that God has given us another day of life, another day in his presence. So we need to take a look at that. So last Sunday... Uh, I talked about uh, words from the cross and some of the, uh, the assurances we got. And I told you about the truths from the cross of Jesus. And that we needed to believe that Jesus was who he said he was. And number two, we needed to believe and have faith in him that he can do what he said he can do. Number three, we needed to repent of our sins and of our sinful nature. And if we responded to him accordingly, then in doing that, so we have to do our part, we would receive renewal, release, redemption, restoration, rescue, and reclamation. All out of ours in there. But I did that all on purpose. Because that all... All those things then lead us to a relationship, a restored a relationship that was broken in the Garden of Eden between us and God. 
See, we needed to have all of those things done. We had to do our part. Jesus did his part on the cross. And he gave us his promises. He gave us the truths that if we believed in him, that who he was, who he said he was, and if we had faith that he can do what he said he can do, which he did, he rose from the dead three days later. And if we do our part, and we recognize this, then he will do his part and he will give us that restoration. The restoration of a relationship that will lead us into eternal life. Now, one of the neat things, and I kind of talked about this yesterday in the men's group at our, at our breakfast time, is I talked about temptation. So I did a devotion on temptation yesterday and, and uh, talked about how as a little kid we had these two little candy stores and you're really tempted to go and spend all of your lunch money at the candy stores instead of on the good stuff at lunch until your dad finds out about it and holy cow, you know. That got put to an end really fast. So, but as we go through these things, because of our belief, because of our faith, because of that restored relationship, then God sends us an advocate. And the advocate is the Holy Spirit to dwell within us. So we have God with us. See, a lot of times we think God's vacant from our lives, but see, God sent us the Holy Spirit that dwells within us so that God is with us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're never alone. Never alone. But we have to do our part. And we continually have to do our part so that God will do his part. Now that sounds a little bit different to some people and they're going, oh, now wait a minute. You know, we can't put conditions on God. But what he says is he gives us free will. And that free will means if we follow his will instead of our own, then he will work wonders in our lives. So we always have to do our part. So as we started, and I talked about this too yesterday, as we start traveling through our Easter tide season, now, for some of you guys, they're going, well, Easter tide. But there is an Easter season. Easter isn't one Sunday out of the year. That's it. Easter tide, as it's called, is the begins on Easter Sunday and runs 50 days through Pentecost Sunday. And it is a time of renewal, redemption, introspection, a time for us to look at who we are, what we are doing with the gifts that God gives us, and the blessings and it gives us time to reflect and look on that relationship that we have with God and make sure that we honor that which was given to us from the cross. See, we, we were given a great, great, great gift on the cross. And so as this season, as we go through this, this season of renewal and redemption and restoration of relationships, it's just like as the earth emerges from winter into spring, we as Christians then emerge from our sinful ways into a rebirth through the resurrection of Christ Jesus on the cross. And if we look at it that way, then we, we know that we have a season of us to renew our faith. It gives us a good time to really concentrate on that and renew what God has given to us all the blessings that he gives us each and every day. So in the opening today, I, I chose John for a reason, and John 3 in there, and, and it was where Jesus told Nicodemus that we must be born again to enter into the kingdom of heaven. We must be born again of the water and the spirit. Rebirth, renewal of our mind, renewal of our bodies, and renewal of our souls in order to get into the kingdom of heaven. So Nicodemus, you know, he was, he was a Pharisee, but he was, he was more than that. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, very well regarded. And Jesus was coming into him, and even though the, these people who the Pharisees dedicated their entire lives to God, they missed the point. They missed the point. And so Jesus was saying, hey, you're going through all the motions, but you're not doing the right things, what God has called you to do. And if they followed the scriptures, if they followed the teachings, if they followed everything that God had sent to them and all the messages, 
they wouldn't be in the position they were. So he says, you know, Nicodemus takes it as they do, all, all of the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, they were very literal. And so they were, they were looking at fulfilling law. That, that was it, for the most part. So Nicodemus says, well, I can't, you know, I can't enter into my mother's womb again. She's dead. So Jesus is explaining it to him, and he misses the point completely again. If we're not reborn of that water in the spirit, renewing of our minds and our bodies and our souls into the service of God, then we miss the point. And Jesus said we need to believe in him in order to receive redemption. And John 3.16 famously tells us that, he, as he is explaining this to Nicodemus, that uh, these are... You know, understanding these are learned men. These are the teachers of the law and experts in the word of God. They dedicated their lives to studying the word of God. Yet they didn't understand what they'd been reading and what they had been teaching. They missed the signs and the messages that God had been sending for hundreds of years. Hundreds. Some only paid attention and only taught to what supported their beliefs. And that was a big problem. That was a big problem. So, what happens? What happens? Well, it kept the Pharisees in power. It kept the common people separated from God. And the common people were not allowed, under the law of Moses, to approach God directly. They were not permitted into the Holy of Holies. In the temple, they could only go to God through the priests in the temple. And so there's a separation, a literal separation between God and the people. And only then, the high priest of the temple was allowed behind the curtains into the Holy of Holies only once a year on Atonement Day the annual Day of Atonement, which is called Yom Kippur. So I'm sure you've probably all heard of Yom Kippur before. But that is the atonement day where once a year they, they would atone for their sins with the sacrifices under the law of Moses. The Holy of Holies then was the innermost chamber in the wilderness, in their wilderness tabernacles that they started with, which was a tent. And the room was a perfect cube. It was 15 feet in each direction. Only one object was housed there. And it was the Ark of the Covenant, God's presence on earth. Okay? There was no light inside the chamber. Only the light of God's glory would fill the room. And then a thick embroidered veil separated the holy place from the holy of holies inside that tent of meeting. And regular priests were allowed into the regular holy space but not behind the curtain into the holy of holies only the high priest and once a year so that high priest would go in on that day of atonement and then he would make a sacrifice for all of the people for their sins for that entire year on yom Kippur. so on that day the high priest would bathe and then put on clean linen garments and his rope had solid gold bells hanging from the hem. The noise of the bells told the people outside them that he was making atonement for their sins. And he entered into the inner sanctuary with a censer. So if you ever see those things where they're swinging the censer and they're burning incense inside it. So he, he had a censer in one hand and he was burning incense and that would produce a very thick smoke hiding the mercy seat on the ark where God was. Anyone who saw God directly would die instantly. They were never allowed to gaze directly onto the face of God. The high priest would then sprinkle the blood of the sacrificed bull and a sacrificed goat on the atonement cover of the ark. And there was a cover over the top of the ark. And that would make amends then for all of the people's, for his sins and all of the people's sins at that time. And under that old covenant then, that God had made through Moses, it required the Israelites to make regular animal sacrifices to God. And God lived among his people through and in the Holy of the Holies. First, 
in the desert tabernacle, and then in the stone temples then in Jerusalem when they were built. So I go through all that so you understand the history behind it all and what was going on. So that you can understand then today, where does that leave us today? Because we don't have they, those things here. We don't have them here today. But see, that's the point. We don't need them here today. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, that reconciliation brought us into a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. We don't, we're no longer separated. So when we talk about, last week we talked about that temple veil being torn in two, that separation between God and his people is now gone. The restoration of a relationship with God was now back in, and it was a one-on-one -on -one relationship fueled by our choices that we make. So we don't need the things that we had. Well, we have to look at ourselves we have to pull back the curtain, if you will, to see what the true tenets of our faith are then. Because now it's up to us to fulfill those tenets of our faith. Everything changed with the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. When Jesus died, that temple veil was torn from top to bottom, signifying that the barrier between God and his people were taken away. And then on Jesus' death, on the Holy of Holies, that first God's throne in heaven became accessible then to every believer, every believer, those who believe on him, that he was who he said he was, that he could do what he said he could do. As believers, those are tenets of our faith. Christians now may approach God confidently, not on their own merit, but through the righteousness credited to them for the shed blood of Christ on the cross. Not because of our own good works, not because of our own good deeds, not because we're just such a great person, but only and through only the blood that was shed on the cross of Jesus Christ. So Jesus atoned once and for all for all of humanity's sins, all that were then, all that were to be, and all that were to come. And at the same time, he became our high priest, acting on our behalf, he became an intercessor, is what that's called. And he intercedes before us and the Father. Because we're still going to come to heaven and we're still going to have the sins that we have to have atoned for. And so when we, when we approach that throne and, and we're being judged, then Jesus will intercede on our behalf. And he says, no, those sins are paid for. Not from our merit, but because of his. And it was our restoration of our ability then to have that personal relationship with God that will last in eternity. So what does it mean for us today? What does the cross mean for us today? It is an eternal assurance of a relationship with God. Our debt has been paid. Our ransom has been paid. And when I was talking about all those R's in there, I didn't put ransom in there for a real good reason. See, that's our rescue. That ransom, when I talked about rescue, he rescued us from eternal damnation because of our sins. The resurrection of Jesus alongside of his crucifixion is a central historical event in the Christian faith. See, without the resurrection, there would be no Christianity, period. None. None whatsoever. Paul states that without the resurrection, our faith would be in vain, and we would still be lost. If Christ had not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. And he tells us that in 1 Corinthians 15, 17. So I'm going to clarify this this morning. Uh, for what this means to Pastor Terry and myself. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are simply going through the motions. It's a means to no end. It's a fool's errand. Wow. So I guess if this is all true, then my message for today is over. 
But see, I don't believe it to be true, not in the very least. I have faith that it isn't true, that Christ did raise from the dead, that our faith is not dead, our faith is not futile, and our sins are forgiven. So Dr. Dell Tackett says, Paul's message is not a minor statement, and it should cause us pause, for it puts a unique historical event into a very sharp perspective. Paul would imply that it is something so critical to our faith that it should be an ever-present reality. The, the absolute astounding cry of he lives should be ongoing, not a one-and-done holiday event once a year, but every day we should be saying, he lives, because he lives within us. He lives within us through the Holy Spirit. And I think it'd be important for us to ponder and meditate upon the deep implications of the tomb. I mean, really, truly empty tomb. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead is really real, absolutely true, a historical fact that has everyday implications. See, when we read that verse last week about the cross, what happened? What happened? Well, I gotta tell you, most people take it completely wrong. See, when they got up there to the, to the tomb and the violent earthquake shook and the stone was rolled away, the stone wasn't rolled away for Jesus to get out. Because you notice, it didn't say he got out. It was so that we could look in and understand and fully realize the seals were broken. Jesus was already raised from the dead, and it was our opportunity to see that we serve a risen Christ. He wasn't there. The stone was rolled away not for Jesus. The stone was rolled away for you and I so that we would understand the tenets of our faith. So I'm now I'm going to put in a shameful plug in. So we're going to start a new study by Dr. Dell Tackett, shortly called the Engagement Project, and it's a follow-up to the Truth Project. And I was uh, telling Don about that this morning. And it's going to have a profound impact on the we, way that we live out our lives as Christ, as Christians, as Christ called us to do. Because the implications of the cross are truly life-altering for a practicing Christian believer. Practicing. We have to put our faith into action. We have to do what he told us to do in the Great Commission and go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, not just ones who are good enough or not just ones who we feel are good enough to hear the message. And so the project from Dr. Del Tackett, the, the engagement project, and I invite you to bring all your friends because this is truly a life-changing event. It is one that is made for us to have a plan to work out our faith. To work out our faith. In other words, put our faith in action, not just words not simply going through the motions. No longer does God confine himself to the Holy of Holies, separated from his people. When Christ ascended into heaven, every Christian became the temple of the Holy Spirit, a dwelling place for a living God. Your body is a temple. My body is a temple. We should treat him that way. But see, we are that temple of the Holy Spirit, God dwelling within us. We need to act like it. <laughs> Jesus said, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be with you and I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. That's John 14, 16 through 18. Through the Holy Spirit given to us as believers in Jesus Christ, we are transformed. We are a new creation. In other words, like Jesus said to Nicodemus, we are born again. 
born again, baptized through the water, baptized through the Spirit, given to us to live within us, a living temple for God. This means that we are the temple. We are the priest of the temple, a royal priesthood. 1 Peter 2.9 tells us, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, to proclaim the virtues of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. See, the cross means that we are no longer just people. But we are now God's people. God's people. Ordained through God, through our faith, through our belief. Ordained of the Holy Spirit. Called into his service through Jesus. Jesus came amongst us and gave us the living example of our faith. By studying the life of Jesus through the New Testament, we are given our pathway then to salvation. Our pathway. See, we have to do our job. We have to do our part. And these then, eternal life through Christ Jesus, these are the tenets of our faith. This is what separates us from any other belief in the world. Belief. Notice I didn't use the term religion. The difference between faith and religion is pretty great. Faith is a complete trust and confidence in something or someone. Faith is an internal belief and it is personal. When we take a look at religion, it's a symptom or a system of uh, specific beliefs and or worship structures, often involving a code of ethics, philosophies. Religious is an external practice or an expression of beliefs. And for our illustrations here, it's corporate in nature. As we come together, we form a <coughs> religion. We form a religion. But there's profound differences in the religions. There's profound differences in beliefs and faith. And that's why I said the tenets of our faith separate us from the beliefs of any other world, any of the rest. In our Christian faith, we have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the living God through Christ Jesus. This was so evident to the disciples that they endured tortures and even death for their faith. For their faith, it made so much difference to them in their faith. They were totally committed to the belief in Jesus as the Son of God. Now, we as Christians today don't have the history with Jesus in person walking with us so we can feel him, touch him, see him on a daily basis. But see, he's still with us. What we do have is because of that restoration, God favor brought to us by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. We can have then a personal relationship with God, with Jesus through our faith in God, our faith in Jesus, that he is who he says he is, and he can do what he said he can do. The tenets of our faith. So what does that take for us? What does that mean for us today? Well, it takes a commitment on our part. It takes effort to do the work. It takes study to know the will of God through the word of God. If we don't study the Word of God, we don't know what the will of God is. We can petition God to show us the will of God, but we need to live in and through His Word. In other, in other words, we have to study and we have to be in the Word of God in order for it to be revealed to us as our faith grows. There's no shortage of ways that we can believe and belong to a living Jesus Christ. There isn't. But it takes faith. It takes belief. It takes repentance. These are the exact things that Jesus was teaching the disciples. It was the exact 
message that he was giving to the people, to the Israelites, to the Gentiles. He was fulfilling the commission. He was giving us the commission through his life and through his words. We need to have faith. We need to believe. We need to call ourselves into repentance. We need to repent of our sins. We need to take the initiative to step up and step out of the world and into the life everlasting. That's on us. That's our portion that we have to do. We have to live out the tenets of our faith. It's as simple as that. All we have to do is call upon the name of Jesus. We need to believe. We need to have faith that he is who he says he is, that he can do what he says he can do. And then we have to act upon that faith. We have to act upon that faith. We have to do our part. God's done his part through Christ Jesus. Now we have to do our part. Let us pray. Lord God, we come to you today with a humbleness of heart, and, and we know we've messed up, and we know that we have fallen short of the glory of God. But see, you give it that blessed assurance that that's not where we have to stay. We don't have to stay lost in a lost world, but that you gave us your son Jesus as a way, as, a, as, as the indicator of what we need to do in our lives to be reconciled with you, to live out our faith. And for that, you give us the Holy Spirit to dwell within us, your spirit dwelling within us to guide and direct our hearts, we have to take time to stop and listen. And then we have to do what you ask us to do. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for grace that you don't give us what we deserve. You give us mercy. You give us grace in the fact that you do give us what we don't deserve freely and openly, an agape love that is never ending, that is given without strings, without attachments, without any kind of, of stuff of the world that we would expect. And then you give us your unending love. You give us forgiveness that even though we don't deserve what you have given us, you gave it to us freely and openly. So we ask today that you would help us to be strong in you and strong in our faith that keeps us from falling and brings us into your glory. Restore us and reconcile us and redeem us today. Lord Jesus, we pray this in your holy name and we ask for your will to be done in our lives today. Amen. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I've been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then the scriptures tell us that he took a cup of wine and gave thanks for it. And he said, take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. Then the Apostle Luke records, he took some bread, and after having given thanks to God for it, he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. A 
And after the supper, he took another cup of wine. And he said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. It is this very act and the remembrance of this very act that brings reminder back to exactly what Mark was preaching about this morning. How all this was done at the cross for us and not for that moment, but for from then on into eternity. The body of Christ broke up here. Take and eat. Blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Father God, we thank you for your amazing grace and sacrifice. God, we thank you for freedom and forgiveness. It's my prayer that our hearts are full of gratitude for all that you have done for us. Help us to never forget your son's death and resurrection. Empower us now to share it, not just within these four walls, not just with our family, not just with our friends, but with everyone. In Jesus' precious name. this morning. So now it's time for prayers for the people again. So if there's any prayers that you'd like me to pray for. Prayers for peace. Yes. Yes. I do have a friend who's had some surgery on Wednesday. Okay. So. Okay. Who's that? Um, if you prefer that we didn't. Oh, okay. Just a friend of Lori's. Friend okay. of Lori's is good. Thank okay. you. Okay. He's having surgery. He hasn't shared that with everybody. So. Sure. I have a husband that's just like that. <laughs> okay. Our son-in-law Gabe has been up since 1.30 fighting a grain bin fire or a grain elevator fire. Oh. And it's out in the middle of nowhere, so there was nothing to block the winds or anything. Oh no. Literally burned the elevator to the ground. Oh my gosh. Oh. And then uh, certainly for myself tomorrow, anytime you put it under mm-hmm. anesthesia, yes. you worry just a little <laughs> bit, but I'll have oral surgery tomorrow yeah. morning. I've got you in here, Terry. <laughs> okay. Father God, we come into your house with praise and honor this morning. As Psalms 100, 1, 4, and 5. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Father, we come before you knowing that the challenges of this life sometimes take away the joy that you provide for us. Like the beauty of your earth, the birds that sing beautiful melodies every day for us to hear, the springing up of the green grass that covers the dirt that not all people get to enjoy, the flowering trees and the pine that smell so fragrant in the spring. And we thank you for the rains, Father God. Sometimes, Father, we forget how to enjoy the simplest of pleasures, whether we are having pain or depression or suffering, loss and sorrow. If we look to you for our help, you will fill our hearts with joy. As Psalms 33 states, weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. As we go through our days, let us lift up those in need. And I pray you will be ever present with them. So I ask for uh, prayers for Lori's friend for surgery, who's having surgery Wednesday, Lord God. I pray that you will um, intervene, bring the Holy Spirit into that surgery room. And just bless the doctor's hands, help them to do exactly what needs to be done. And help him to heal quickly in Jesus' holy name. I ask for um, peace to be with the firemen. Uh, Gabe and they're fighting this fire for this grain bin, Lord Jesus. Bring the rain to help them wash it away. In Jesus' name, take the winds down as well, Lord God. Just let it be contained in Jesus' holy name. 
Be with the people in Taiwan who had a massive earthquake this week and all who suffer from tornadoes and loss and damage this week. Just comfort them, Lord God. May you guide them and help them to hold on to the promises you give in your word in times of struggle and confusion. May they reach out to you, the one that can lift them out of the pit of despair and guide them through the darkest nights. Help them to open your word and lean on you and find you are there with them to comfort and take care of them. You are God and there is no other. Father God, I lift up Terry this week. Please be with him through this surgery that he's having tomorrow. Comfort him and let the Holy Spirit just rest on him and give him peace throughout this whole surgery, Lord God. And let it be um, done completely and perfectly in your will, Lord Jesus. And let him heal quickly, Lord God. Father, I lift up the homeless for provision this week. Comfort for your children. Feed them and put Christian people in their path to guide them into a right relationship with you. And Father, I lift up Jen to you this week for surgery on her leg that is happening Wednesday as well. Please guide, please guide the doctor's hands so that all will be well. Let the Holy Spirit be with us in the hospital to calm our, anxiety, our anxious hearts. Let, us go, let it all go as planned and let the healing be quick. I pray for travel mercies and healing for Steve and myself as we travel from Illinois and back. And we thank you, God, for loving us unconditionally. We thank you that you went to the cross to bear our sins upon you, knowing we are not worthy of your love, but you give it anyway. Thank you, Jesus, for your unfailing love for all humanity. Let our faith be stronger than our fears this week, Lord Jesus. Help us to be more than conquerors in faith, believing in you, Jesus. Let us declare our victories in Jesus' holy and precious name. Thank you, Denise. It is an honor and a pleasure when we can come before God and intercede for others, that we edify them and lift them up. That is what the body of Christ does, and we, we talked about that in the men's group again yesterday. We had a good meeting yesterday. You may have thought about that. Um, the temptation guides are on the back back there if you want to take anyone with you. But see, God put us together as the family. As I told you, we were restored into the family of God. We're not just common people now. We're a royal priesthood. As that royal priesthood, we are called to edify each other, to lift each other up. No, this is going to be sermon number two. But we are called to come together in communion with each other as the body of Christ, as the family of Christ, God's children, to support each other, to lift us up, and to help us get through each and every day. But see, the, the thing about it is, we gotta do our part. That seems to be the theme of the day, but we do have to do our part. We have to be able to allow others to come in to lift us up so that we can receive the blessing and at the same time, lifting others up, we receive a blessing as well. So if you don't allow others to come alongside you, to edify you, to help you, and to hold you up, you're robbing them of the blessing as well. So let's always try and intercede with one another to help one another, to bring our uh, wants and needs to God on behalf of others, and that's called serving. And that's what Jesus tells us to do. So this does bring us to the end of our online portion of our service this morning. Uh, we've curated some songs for you. Hopefully this morning uh, they really spoke to me and hopefully they'll speak to you as well. Uh, so we invite you, those who are online to listen to those. Unfortunately, we can't just play them out here because of all the licensing fun stuff that goes along with it. But uh, we really, truly thank you for being with us here this morning. And uh, we invite you to come in and see us in person and partake in a men's breakfast or a movie or orange track racing or any of the other activities of the church. And especially our Wednesday study so that you can be brought into God's word and into God's presence through his word. So let's go and close this out with a word of prayer. 
Gracious Lord God, we come before you today. We confess that we are in sinners. We are in need of your grace and mercy. And we repent of our sins today. We pray for forgiveness. And we pray that by the power and the love and the blood of Jesus, that we can be redeemed, that we can be made whole with you again. Lord Jesus, we ask for you to come into our hearts today. We make you our Lord and our Savior. We thank you for that blessed assurance that you give us that you will be with us in heaven and that your spirit gives us the strength, the hope, and the love to be your disciples, your hands and feet in this lost world that we have today. Lord, we lift up our lives, our church, our city, and our nation to you. Oh, we are all in, in dire need of your mercy, your grace, your restoration. We ask that you would do a mighty act of healing in us and in the world today and that your word and your name would be boldly proclaimed and that your works would be done. Embolden us today to step up and step out, to bring home the lost. Lead us to growth in your spirit and keep us unto you each and every day. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.